Hello, and welcome to the Mill Valley Historical Society's First Wednesday Speaker Series, an event we host the first Wednesday of every month, usually at the Mill Valley Public Library, but for now, because of the pandemic, safely online. My name is Deborah Schwartz, and I'm on the Board of Directors for the Mill Valley Historical Society in charge of the First Wednesday Speaker Series and the Oral History Program. Tonight, I am delighted to welcome Ranger Matt Circle, and his talk is titled The Civilian Conservation Corps on Mount Tamalpais, A Lasting Legacy. Before we begin, I want to say to all of you out there who are already members of the Mill Valley Historical Society, thank you for your support. And to those of you who are not, please join us. Membership ensure, ensures that you will be alerted to future presentations such as tonight's, our annual walk into history, which hopefully we'll have this year. You will also receive Chuck Oldenburg's charming Mill Valley history vignettes via email, and you will be updated on other historical events in our town and nearby. Membership to the Mill Valley Historical Society is very affordable and just a click away on our Mill Valley Historical Society website. The Mill Valley Historical Society is very fortunate indeed to be partnered with the Mill Valley Public Library. And we are thankful to continue our speaker series in this safe and accessible format. You don't see her, but with us tonight is our wonderful history librarian, Natalie Snoyman helping us manage this event. As always, Natalie, thank you for your help. I love libraries. They give so much and ask so little. I particularly love the Mill Valley Public Library. Did you know the Mill Valley Library is listed as one of the most beautiful libraries in the Bay Area, right up there with the Doe Memorial and Morrison Libraries at UC Berkeley? and the Mechanics Institute Library and Chess Room in San Francisco's Financial District. But the Mill Valley Library has something unique, a working fireplace, which was blazing away today. UC Berkeley has 24 libraries, but no operational fireplaces. No fireplaces in any other Marin County Library or anywhere else in the Bay, with the exception of the Claremont Library in the East Bay, it has two fireplaces, both in full operation today, and the Benicia Library, which has one, also blazing away today. So aren't we cozy on a cold winter's day? For those unfamiliar with Zoom meetings and webinars, here's a brief tutorial on how things work. For practical purposes, the audience must be muted for this webinar. But functional tools are located at the bottom of your screen to help us communicate with each other. If you can't see them now, just hover your cursor over the area and they should appear. Now look for the chat icon. The chat tool allows you to post comments, say hello to friends, and we encourage you to add information during tonight's event. Next is the Q&A option. The Q&A option is where you can post questions you may have about tonight's presentation or anything related to tonight's event. And I'll address those questions to Matt after his talk. But if you have comments or personal stories to share, the chat room is the best place for that. There are other Zoom options to explore, but they're not pertinent to tonight's event, so we'll keep going. Tonight's talk will last about one hour. And then we'll take some time for questions and comments from the audience. The Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, one of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's most successful New Deal programs served on Mount Tam between 1933 to 1941. During those years, the CCC shaped Mount Tam parks that we know and enjoy today. Marin Water, Marin Water Waters Mount Tamalpais watershed, what have I written here? Um, the watershed uh, and the state park in Muir Woods National Monument have all benefited from the group's service. Tonight, Matt Circle is here to talk about the CCC, their work on the mountain and the program's lasting legacy. Matt Circle grew up in Marin, graduating Redwood High School in 1989. 
He started working on Mount Tam in 1991 during his summer break from the University of Idaho, where he graduated with a BS in Wildland Recreation Management from the U of I's College of Forestry. He has served as a park ranger with Marin Water since 1995 and currently serves as senior park ranger. Matt's brief bio doesn't really describe well enough, though, the depth and breadth of his presence on Mount Tam. He is who I call when I have questions about anything to do with our watershed, be it plains or trains, trails or trees, drought, fire, and rescue. He truly has his finger on the pulse of Mount Tam. And his love of the mountain is evident in his beautiful photography. He educates and inspires and keeps us on the right track. And do, I encourage you, listen to his oral history if you'd like to know more about Matt and his work and his relationship with Mount Tamalpais. So I am especially pleased to have Matt with us tonight. Friends and history lovers, please give a warm welcome to Matt Circle. Matt? Thank you, Deborah, um, for that kind introduction. So tonight we're going to learn more about the legacy of the CCC, both on a national level and how that national program uh, impacted Mount Tam and provides a lasting legacy that we all enjoy to, to this day. We often know about the Mountain Theater, which was built by the CCC, but they did so much more on Mount Tam. So before I get started, I want to give a thanks to the National Park Service, California State Parks, my employer, the Marin Water District, uh, the Mo Valley Historical Society, and the Marin County History Museum, and the National Archives for providing the information that helped make this presentation possible. So without further ado, I will start our program. So. So that's from a newsreel the National Park Service put out in the mid 30s about the work of the CCC and it ties directly into the legacy and the work that was done on Mount Tamalpais. Tonight we're going to discuss what made the CCC possible both nationally and what led to its use on Mount Tam, some of the basic details about the Civilian Conservation Corps, and then cover its legacy on Mount Tam and the many uh, features and work that they did up on the mountain. So realistically, the use of the CCC on Mount Tam has its origins nearly a century ago when the Tamil Pius National Park Association was formed to protect Mount Tam and hopefully uh, turn it into a national park. The cornerstone of land preservation in Marin occurred in 1908 when Teddy Roosevelt declared Muirwood the National Monument. This was the first bit of parkland and the first publicly owned portion of Mount Tam. Prior to this, it was all privately owned. And two of the three water companies that own the majority of Mount Tam prohibited the public from enjoying its many trails. The next key event occurred in 1912, where the Tamil Pius Conservation Club was formed to help uh, lobby to get Mount Tam protected as a public park. Also in 1912, the Marin Municipal Water District was established with the goal of bringing the private water companies and their holdings on Mount Tam into public ownership. Moving forward to 1915, a bond measure was approved by the voters of Marin Water to fund the Alpine project and to purchase the private water companies, including their watershed lands on Mount Tam. A key selling point of this bond measure was it was Mount Tamalpais would be opened as a public park. Michael O'Shaughnessy, who went on to design the Hetch Hetchy system, served on the Water District Board of Directors at the time and stated in a, the lead up to the vote that not only will we secure the mountainside as a watershed, but as a public park. 
That same year before the vote, William Kent promised to donate the steep ravine area of Mount Tamalpais to MMWD as a public park. This ended up not happening, but plays a key role in about a decade. Kent did donate some land to the water district on Blystale Ridge, about 39 acres. And this was the first time a local agency had land donated to it in Marin for use as a public park. The portion of the watershed that was donated for many years afterwards was known as Kent's Corner, which is in this area of the watershed. Between 1916 and 1917, MMWD purchased the private watershed lands on Mount Tam, including its three peak. This event, which preserved 10,700 acres of Mount Tamil Pius as a watershed and as a public park. This is the keystone event of land preservation in Marin and all future land preservation in Marin was built around this initial 10,700 acres of watershed. Another key element that led to both the CCC and uh, what happened with the CCC on Mount Tam is the creation of the National Park Service in 1916. Um, it should be noted that William Kent, who donated Muir Woods to the federal government, also helped write the Organic Act, which created the National Park Service. And under the leadership of Stephen Mather, who was the first director of the National Park Service, unprecedented support for parks across the country was established. He also hired the first cadre of park managers and park planners who would shape a common vision on what parks should look like and be. One of the key aspects of this, the early years of the Park Service was the establishment of park rustic architecture or parkitecture for the development of the parks in a way that would blend in with nature. This image still dominates the public's perception and expectations of what a park should look like. Stop five, rustic architecture. Guernsey State Park is where some of the most prominent National Park Service planners hone their trade. People like Conrad Wirth and Thomas Vint. Conrad Wirth supervised the CCC program in a number of state parks, including Guernsey. Thomas Vint was a Park Service planner who believed that the landscape is integral to a visitor's experience of traveling through a park. Together, these men were largely responsible for the rustic architectural movement, which developed during the Depression era. The goal of rustic architecture is to design buildings and other structures that blend into the colors, textures, and shapes present in nature. Rustic buildings are designed to seek harmony with their physical settings through sensitive use of native vegetation and construction materials, and through the incorporation of natural colors into a building's exterior. Rustic architecture conveys a general feeling that a structure was built by pioneer craftsmen. While these buildings may sometimes appear crudely built, Rustic structures are in fact excellent examples of design and craftsmanship. The Sitting Bull Picnic Shelter is a superb example of rustic architecture. Characterized by its use of native materials, you can see how well the structure blends into the surrounding landscape. As you approach the shelter, try to identify where the natural landscape surrounding it ends and the foundation of the shelter begins. The Sitting Bull Shelter was one of Worth's favorite examples of rustic architecture. It was no small feat for the young men of the CCC to build these structures. It required hard, labor-intensive work. Enrollees created building sites and shaped the large exterior stones using hand tools. Block and tackle systems were used to manually hoist heavy stones, while other workers secured rocks in place with hand-mixed mortar. Withstanding the passage of time, the Sitting Bull Shelter exemplifies the craftsmanship and pride put forth by its builders. There is little doubt CCC enrollees earned their $30 monthly wages. We built a lot of state parks, for instance, and we built all the buildings that were in them and picnic facilities, benches that we built in the 30s are still being used today. 
So another uh, key element that Stephen Mather and the National Park Service played was the, what was called at the time the state park movement. Uh, Mather convened the first conference on state parks in 1921. It was the, be the beginning of the state park movement and the first real effort to democratize parks by bringing them to the people. The state park movement in Marin. In 1927, Stephen Mather advocated for more parkland and a talk he gave to the Rotary Club in San Rafael. Uh, this article from the Marin Water District's Messenger, which was a monthly newsletter at the time, it talks about the need for more state parks and the establishment of the Mount Tamalpais State Park and also praises the district's management of the neighboring lands. So how did this impact Marin and California? So in 1927, the California State Park System was established with the creation of what's now the California Department of Park and Recreation. In 1928, uh, St uh, Mount Tamalpais State Park was established to preserve the steep ravine area, which was donated to the state by the Kent family, and to preserve the area between the Mount Tamalpais watershed and Muir Woods. As you can see on this map, the original Mount Tam State Park was significantly smaller than the over 6,000 acre park we know today. Another key influence on why the CCC came to Marin in the 30s was the fires that burned in Marin between the, the teens and the early 1930s. As many of you are familiar with the 1929 Mill Valley fire, which is this fire here, but other catastrophic fires occurred during this period. This large fire was the 1923 fire, which started in Ignacio and within two days was on Bolinas Bridge. That same day that fire started, 600 homes burnt in the Berkeley Hills in the first East Bay Hills fire. And Sonoma County had fires similar to what happened in 2017. This other large fire was the 1913 fire that started near West Point Inn, burnt down into Muir Woods, burning the original Muir Woods Inn built by the railroad down. Then a wind uh, switch came and drove the fire towards Magnolia Avenue in the area between Kent Field and Larkspur. So th these fires had an impact not only on the citizens of Marin, but the fire agencies responsible, in this case, the Tamil Pires Forest Fire District, and also the Marin Water District, which wanted to protect the watershed lands from fire. The key element that brought it all together was the Great Depression. At the peak of the Great Depression, the unemployment rate was 25%, one out of every four people were unemployed and 54% of men between 18 and 25 were either unemployed or underemployed. It was the greatest economic crisis our country had ever faced. In 1933, the chief concern of the American government was to break the back of a bad depression. Among the conditions to be remedied were two President Roosevelt recognized at once. Employment for hundreds of thousands of young men and war veterans was imperative. Havoc wrought by soil erosion had long since shown the necessity of the immediate restoration, conservation, and further development of the country's natural resources. As one solution for both problems, the organization and work of the Civilian Conservation Corps was undertaken. And in two years, through this unique plan, both problems were well on their way toward solution as great aids to economic recovery. The saving of natural resources was conservation pure and simple. One important phase of the development of these resources was more than that. It was the making of a nationwide system of recreational areas, smaller, more numerous state parks, closer to the people, more easily accessible for their use, supplementing the magnificent national parks. So FDR was a key in the creation of the Civilian Conservation Corps. He, like his cousin Teddy, had a deep connection to the land and the conservation. He saw the environmental restoration of the family estate at Hyde Park. His love of the land was passionate and total, but it extended beyond just the family estate, but he felt the same way about 
the land across the country. In 1931, when FDR was the governor of New York, he started a Conservation Corps-like program uh, doing conservation work using unemployed men. And across the United States at the time, including California, the state was hiring unemployed men to do conservation work in partnership with the US Forest Service. By 1932, 25 camps on Forest Service land with 200 men each were established. This is prior to the Civilian Conservation Corps being established. So FDR, the New Deal and the CCC. The New Deal with a series of programs, public works, financial reforms and regulations enacted to fight the Great Depression with the goals of relief, recovery and reform. Within days of becoming the president, he outlined the plan for what would became known as the Civilian Conservation Corps. Virginia, inspiring his forest army by a personal visit, President Roosevelt makes his first tour of the Civilian Conservation Corps camp in the Shenandoah Valley. <laughs> After inspecting Skyland, the Commander-in-Chief takes a seat at the head of the table to eat with the boys, and he enjoys every bite of the plain, wholesome food furnished at the camp. It's very good to be here at these Virginia CCC camps. I wish I could see them all over the country. I hope that all over the country they're in as fine condition as the camps that I've seen today. I wish that I could take a couple of months off from the White House and come down here and live with them because I know I'd get full of health the way they have. The only difference is that they've put on an average of about 12 pounds apiece since they got here, and I'm trying to take off 12 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Within 44 days of FDR becoming president, the first CCC camp opened. At its peak, it had over a half million enrollees and 2,900 in about 2,900 camps. During the nine years of existence, the CCC operated uh, in a total of 4,500 camps in national parks, forests, as well as state and local parks. In California, between 1933 and 42, 80 camps in California performed park-related work under the direction of the National Park Service. It was a model of interagency cooperation. The Labor Department recruited the enrollees, later adding the VA to recruit unemployed veterans. The War Department was responsible for running the camps, providing logistics and transportation, administration and supplies. The Department of Agriculture with the Forest Service primarily or the Department of Interior primarily using the National Park Service directed the work depending on what type of work was being done. The Park Service played the largest role in the Interior Department, not only overseeing the national parks, but overseeing and planning work in state, regional, and county parks. So the basic requirements at the time, initially you had to be between 18 and 25, your family had to be on government relief. You were you earn thirty dollars a month, or where the term a dollar a day comes from, twenty five dollars, which had to be sent home. You could enroll in for six months and could serve up to two years. They received food, clothing, shelter, medical care, vocational training, and education. In May of nineteen thirty three, they added veterans after the Second Bonus Army did a march on Washington, and they said. Hoover sent MacArthur, who broke up the first uh, bonus march. And then, as they said, an FDR sent the first lady. So this gives you a typical layout of what a CCC camp would look like. So by 1935, they had picked a standardized design, basically using army style barracks and buildings that were basically pre-manufactured and were easy to assemble and set up and even move if necessary. Uh, the camp that I'll cover a little bit later at Sky Oaks was based on this basic model. And this model could be found all across the country. The typical camp had 200 enrollees 
there would be two off army officers or other military officers in charge of the camp. There would be a camp doctor, a civilian superintendent and support staff who were employees of the National Park Service. They also employed what they called LEM or local expert men who brought specific knowledge on local conditions, building practices and environmental concerns. It could be a plumber, a mason, a carpenter. So it not only provided employment for the enrollees, but local uh, individuals who might have the job skills, but were unemployed or underemployed. Additionally, many National Park Service camps had college students assigned to them during their summer months to get practical field experience. And I'll touch on this in a bit again. So this would be the typical day for the rolling in the CCC, starting at 6 a.m. One million unemployed young men and war veterans were enrolled in the Civilian Conservation Corps in the first two years of its existence. Enrollees are taken from the states on a population percentage basis. Their personal care is in the hands of the United States Army, the country's most experienced organization for a task of such magnitude. Each state park corps camp is set up according to a carefully organized plan. A superintendent employed by the state park division of the National Park Service is in charge of the work. Skilled workmen from the vicinity of each camp conduct all work that requires such supervision, the enrollees serving as helpers. The base pay of each enrollee is $30 per month, $25 of which is mailed directly to his declared dependents. Everything the enrollee requires is supplied him. Clothing, comfortable barracks, good food. Doctors are in regular attendance. Direction of this unique and fundamentally sound program to preserve and develop a nation's resources by means of a plan that places high value on manpower is in the hands of some of the country's most important individuals and agencies. Headed by President Roosevelt, the man who conceived it and put it into action. The CCC was probably the most popular program of FDR's New Deal. It received broad uh, bipartisan support, unlike some of his other programs. People learned firsthand how conservation benefited them and their communities. It brought conservation, and in many cases, parks to Main Street. Often overlooked is the education and training opportunities within the CCC. In the functioning of the Civilian Conservation Corps plan, however, there is another and even more interesting form of rehabilitation. Among hundreds of thousands of young men and war veterans enrolled, there have been many unable to read or write. Others whose schooling has been interrupted were found to be slipping in the matter of education and morale. The important job of mentally rehabilitating this extremely valuable cross-section of the manpower of the country has been entrusted to the Office of Education, Department of the Interior. Competent instructors in Conservation Corps camps conduct classes in many of the educational branches. The boys are given the opportunity to go to school just as they might have done years ago. In addition, there are many practical manual training courses intended to prepare the enrollees for happier and more remunerative work when their association with the Corps has ended. Many of the Conservation Corps camps communicate with each other over shortwave radio sets for both transmission and reception, which the boys themselves have made. Do the enrollees welcome these opportunities? Well, a field report not long ago disclosed that in a single Conservation Corps camp, within a single month, five enrollees, in their joy at knowing for the first time how to use them, spent a big share of their $5 cash allowances for fountain pen. So, so as of that short film clip covers, there was remedial education, recreational related education, and vocational training offered by the CCC. Not enough is known of the civilian conservation or conservation of civilians part of this unique nationwide recovery plan. More than a million young men and war veterans have been participants. Few of them have failed to absorb benefits of even greater value to them and the mere employment and money they have been given. 
These boys here are being taught many things about tree and plant life, insect pest control and so on, which they can apply in later life. In the end, over 57,000 illiterate men learned to read and write in the CCC, and 90% of the participants participated in both education and vocational programs. The CCC played an integral part in the National Park Service plan to de democratize nature. Uh, the state park movement evolved into the 30s to take advantage of the CCCs. Uh, they helped construct over 800 state parks and hundreds of city and county parks. The NPS through the CCC shaped how Americans interacted with nature. Some scholars believe the CCC program pushed state park development ahead by 50 years. The primary principle of this park service plan was to place recreational parks within the reach of every citizen, or in other words, to democratize nature in the CCC was the tool that made that happen. In the conservation core development of state parks is found a perfect blending of conservation and recreation. Besides protecting and saving land and timber and wildlife, this phase of the program develops recreation areas for people who have not had them before. Many kinds of work are required to develop this recreation plan. Hundreds of dams will make lakes in regions where large natural bodies of water are unknown. Hiking and bridle trails wind through the parks, each of these trails being constructed by the Conservation Corps in state parks in 42 states is carefully placed by expert park planners, so the natural growth of the area will be harmed as little as possible, and yet so points of interest can be reached. Splendid views few men have seen because the peaks were inaccessible now open up as these trails lead hikers to the mountaintops. Racing brooks and deep streams are spanned by rustic bridges of good design. They are built by skilled labor and conservation corps enrollees according to plans of graduate engineers and architects. Though thousands gather in the parks to enjoy these new recreational facilities, the old parking problem is no bother. Adequate spaces have been provided. Camping is encouraged and every outdoor convenience is furnished. Open stoves and picnic tables are spotted through the areas, these too built by the Corps enrollees under the direction of skilled laborers and expert designers. Any health menaces that might exist are obliterated by the construction of complete water and waste disposal systems to serve all developed areas. Probably the most attractive feature of a typical state park is the cabin community located in one of the area's desirable spots and open to visitors who want to spend a night or a week. State Park Conservation Corps companies cover the country and work through all the seasons. These snug cabins in Pueblo State Park in Colorado are going up despite the winter snow. Recreation buildings and picnic shelters are state park essentials. This one stands on the moss-draped banks of the Black Edisto, one of South Carolina's loveliest low country streams. In some sections, notably the Southwest, park development runs more strongly than elsewhere to building operations. In a country as large as America, the characteristics of the various regions differ widely. Indeed, in these differences is found the nation's charm. There are mountainous areas covered with fresh green trees and dripping with clear cold streams. In other sections are vast ranges and plains of rock, and still elsewhere are the lowlands that stretch down to the sea. The natural features of the state parks vary with the regions in which they are located. In each section, there is a different recreational appeal. It follows then that a park's development plan generally conforms to the features and requirements of the surrounding country in order that the park may best serve the peculiar recreational needs of the people in its particular locality. In Texas, where nature takes on a rough magnificence, many of the required park structures are built of stone. Here is the land of the cliff dwellers, 
and National Park Service architects have designed park buildings to recreate a prehistoric atmosphere. This recognition and further development of the architecture typical of the history and natural characteristics of the country's several sections is important in emergency conservation work. Building trails, cutting fire lanes, and protecting and improving timber and land make the conservation work program essentially one requiring well-directed massed manpower. But on the construction project, skilled labor is necessary. Carpenters, bricklayers, plumbers, and electricians are hired from the community in which the camp is located. These men work on the park jobs with the Conservation Corps boys as helpers. Not only does this furnish employment for skilled labor and get the job well done, but it provides the enrollees with excellent opportunities to learn trades. Splitting handmade shingles is a colorful task. The tools for splitting the blocks are ingenious, as are also the appliances devised for holding the shingles during the finishing processes. And almost every camp has its own village blacksmith plying his fascinating and still useful trade. So it is all these factors join forces in this unique phase of the recovery program, a federal aid project to save and enjoy a country, to keep nature unsullied and unspoiled wherever possible as a healing retreat from the increasing difficulties of modern life, a project directed by that government agency which has given the world the American National Parks, the National Park Service of the United States Department of the Interior. So that pretty well covers the categories of work that was done in parks across the country and on Mount Tan. So the CCC arrived on Mount Tam in October of 1933, and it left Mount Tam in April of 1941. At the time, there were three main park agencies on Mount Tam, the National Park Service, the Marin Municipal Water District, and the then Division of State Parks, now the California Department of Parks and Recreation. And I tried to include the period badges and job titles from the time. So you had the park rangers working for the National Park Service, the patrolmen and also late keepers of the Marin Municipal Water District, and the park wardens and custodians of the Division of Parks. You had several supporting agencies too, the Tamalpaya Forest Fire District, which is a direct predecessor of the Marin, uh, Marin County Fire Department and the Tamil Pirates Conservation Club, which at the time employed what they called trailmen, including Matt Davis, the legendary Mount Tam trail builder, who were employed to build and maintain trails on Mount Tam and oftentimes members of the TCC and their trailmen were also deputized by the Sheriff's Office to provide a law enforcement presence in the park and also on the private lands that were open to the public. The TCC, because of its heavy involvement in trail work at the time, was often consulted and, and helped advise the CCC on their trail work on Mount Tam. The first camp was Camp Muir Woods, which was actually located near Lake Lagunitas. It was built Camp Mount Tamalpais, which is located where the current Alice Eastwood camp is. It was a temporary tent camp only used between October of 1933 and April of 1941. Besides building Camp Mount Tamalpais, it did other work on Mount Tam State Park, Muir Woods, and for Marin Water. So this current location is where the overflow lot for Lake Lagunitas is. The sludge pond for the water treatment plant is in this area. And if you look in the background, this is Bald Hill. And in this ravine is where uh, Fish Gulch would be located. The next camp was Camp Mount Tamalpais, which was built by Camp Muir Woods and that opened in April of 1934. It's one of its primary goals was to, de to develop Mount Tam State Park and it also did improvements in Muir Woods and on water district lands. So the two, two main CCC camps, their priority work depended on the agency they were working for. It was for the state park, it was to develop Mount Tam State Park. For Muir Woods, it was to 
improve the current infrastructure and upgrade it. And the water district, fire prevention played an important role along with uh, addressing sanitary concerns and doing limited recreational improvements. At the time, the water district built and maintained uh, the fuel breaks, often called fire trails, in the fire and access roads. But they left uh, trail building to individuals where the water district would inspect and improve the work, but it was done primarily by the TCC and other groups. And once the CCC came, uh, the, the, they were incorporated into improving the trail system. Camp Mount Tamalpais was largely responsible for the work at Mountain Theater and at the Gardner Lookout. The last CCC company left Camp Mount Tamalpais in 1940. It was used for 11 operational periods. The operational period is six months, so it was occupied for a total of 5.5 years. This just gives you a few views around the camp. Life in the camp, they had their uh, basketball team, uh, the enrollees learning surveying skills. They also had the recreation hall, their own band. Shows you a little bit of the life of the typical enrollees of the CCC at Camp Mount Tamalpais. The third camp was Camp Alpine Lake, which was built by the crews from Camp Mount Tamalpais. This is located just down the road from Sky Oaks Ranger Station, is located currently, and near where the fee station, where you pay your entrance fees for the water district, which is about right here where the red dot is. It was mainly focused on the water district lands on the north side of Mount Tam. Originally, it was designated State Park Camp 36, but later de redesignated as Municipal Area or MA1 in 1939. The last company left it in 1941. It was used for eight operational periods or a total of four years. After the CCC left in 1941, it housed Royal Navy sailors whose ship was being worked on at Mayor Island and was later used by the State Guard and Army during World War II, where it was renamed Camp William Frank Park. This is a panoramic I've stitched together of Camp Alpine Lake during its heyday. This is taken from the water district film, White Gold. So up in this area in the far corner, you can see some of the structures of Camp California, which was a summer engineering camp for UC Berkeley. So I have not been able to find any documented evidence yet, but there was probably collaboration and coordination between the CCC and the student engineers at uh, Camp California to do some of the work for the CCC and engineer it on Mount Tam. And until recently, we did not know there was an archway entrance to Camp Alpine Lake. This is also taken from the Water District film White Gold, which I will play for you now. And is assisting you in maintaining this park through a civilian conservation corps. The Civilian Conservation Corps Camp on the road to Lake Lagunitas beyond Sky Oaks. It opened in 1935 and closed in 1938. by the Civilian Conservation Corps, a wide variety of improvements were made to enhance the public's enjoyment of the watershed. During the period from December 1941 to May 1943, the camp was occupied by the California State Guard.
So the work you see going on here is the fish rearing ponds built at Lake Lagunitas picnic area. So the CCC work on Mount Tam had several main focuses, recreational related improvements, fire control and prevention, the mountain theater, and then I'll also discuss other project and other CCC duties on Mount Tam. The photo here is a landscaping crew from the CCC installing native plants at the mountain cedar site as part of its landscaping. So re the recreational related improvements included newer upgraded trails, newer upgraded picnic areas and campgrounds, picnic shelters and community kitchens, camp stoves, fireplaces and barbecues, signs, comfort stations and restrooms, refuge disposal, and in this picture is a seasonal wading pool in Phoenix Lake or Phoenix Creek at the Phoenix Lake picnic area below Phoenix Dam. By this bridge here, if you go there today, you can see where a, a wooden boards would be inserted into the rock work to create a seasonal wading pool. And this would have made sense for the water district in this seas to do this because even in the 30s, state regulations prohibited swimming in domestic water supply reservoirs which is obviously very tempting for people to do. So providing this waiting area, you take away some of that desire to wanna to go into the actual lake. In modern days, um, it should be noted that the water district in Southern California, Casitas Municipal Water District, who actually in their recreational area have developed a water park that to take the pressure off people wanting to swim in the reservoir. So a little historical parallel. So here's a list of some of the trails that the CCC worked on in the photo is work being done on the Ben Johnson Trail. So a lot of the state park trails that we enjoy today were built or greatly improved by the CCC and a lot of the water district trails were improved like Cataract Trail. It should be noted what used to be called Upper North Side Trail from Collier to Rifle Camp was actually built by the CCC. And here are some more CCC workers working on one of the trails on Mount Tam and some of the other trails the CCC worked on on Mount Tam. So a lot of the trails we still use today have their uh, CCC origin or CCC work. Here's a list of the picnic areas built or and campgrounds built and improved by the CCC. A lot of the water district picnic areas were originally the equivalent of backpacking camps slash picnic grounds. And up until 1967, you could stay overnight at those campgrounds. And after 67, they became strictly for day use and evolved into our current picnic areas. It also should be noted that portions of a CCC picnic table are still in use today at Petrero Camp. They were moved from the original location but it's still the original parts just in a new location. They also built the picnic shelter at Phoenix Lake. Uh, does everyone recognize this structure here? It's a bit of a quiz, so it's not what you think. So the picnic shelter at Phoenix Lake or now known as a three bear hut was modeled after a CCC built shelter in Mohawk Park in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And you can see how they, in both cases, they use the same basic design, which was common for the CCC to do, but using the local rocks and material. Sadly, uh, the structure at, in Tulsa no longer stands, but recently the town of Ross rehabbed and restored the three bear hut to its former glory. And it's a model of restoration of CCC work. It also should be noted that the design of it is more common to the Southwest and the Texas, Oklahoma area and with an uncommon design in California. The next shelter was what was originally built as a community kitchen more commonly found in the Pacific Northwest at Lake Lagunitas. I show this to show how in different parks, you can find that similar design, the barbecue, one of the group barbecues at 
Lake Lagunitas and a similar barbecue at New Brighton State Beach. And the picnic fireplaces that you can find still to this day all over country and the only remaining intact one at Lake Lagunitas. The uh, CCC signs, some of which are still in service today on Mount Cam, including this one at Laurel Dell. Sadly, the Deer Park Meadow or Deer Park Picnic Area sign, to my knowledge, has been lost to history, but I recently rediscovered its plans. Comfort stations and restrooms were a key thing at Muir Woods, Mount Cam State Park, and on the watershed. And some of the upgrades include the facilities more advanced than what we have today. Lake Lagunitas and Phoenix Lake both had flush toilet systems, which have long since been taken out of service. It might seem weird, but our comfort stations or outhouses on the watershed can be considered nationally historically significant. They're featured in one of the Park Service planning books that shows the basic design. To this day, one of them still remains on service on the watershed at Barth's Retreat. And you can find a nearly identical design still in use at Mount Diablo State Park. Uh, people often ask what this stone structure is at Lake Le uh, Phoenix Lake. It's actually a trash incinerator built on a basic CCC slash park service trash incinerator plan. They also installed uh, at uh, the hiking campgrounds and picnic areas uh, smaller trash incinerators. To this day, one still survives at rifle camp. They built numerous water systems for drinking water and also sinks in the, some of the campgrounds. Some of the drinking fountains are still in use today at Bootjack, Pantol, East Peak, and Mountain Theater, while out of service examples can be found at Matt Davis near Nora, the old Rattlesnake Camp at on Bootjack Trail and at West Point End. The other major work was fire control and prevention, which included the Gardner Lookout at East Peak, numerous fire roads, fuel breaks or fire trails, fuel reduction along fire roads, firefighting, and also spring fed water tanks for water supply for firefighting. So this shows you just in a seven months period, some of the work done by the CCC for on fire prevention. So the red lines are new fire trails which were built. The orange lines were pre-existing fire trails which often were maintained by the CCC. The pink is roadside brushing and fuel reduction for fire protection. The yellow are new fire roads and the green was a planned fire road from Rocky Ridge and Hidden Lake to Cataract Trail, which was never built, but eventually evolved into the Lagoon Fire Road and the Laurel Dell Fire Road idea. Also on the map is some of the water tanks put in for firefighting and also the work done to build the new lookout at East Peak. So here's the list of the fire roads that were built and or improved by the CCC. It should be noted the Liberty Bontempe Truck Trail is now considered part of the Liberty Gulch Trail, which is in the process of being adopted as a system route by the Water District. It had the distinction of being the fire road in service for the least amount of time. It was completed in 1936 and taken out of service in 1941 once Alpine Dam was raised. Here's the plans for the Gardner Lookout at East Peak from the Water District Files. Many people do not realize it, but the East Peak and the Fire Lookout are still owned by the Water District, and the Fire Lookout is currently leased to the Marin County Fire Department, where it's seasonally staffed with volunteer fire lookouts. Some of the fuel break work and water tanks for firefighting. What's interesting with the fuel break work, uh, Instead of just cutting some of the vegetation, they removed some of it, roots and all, for use in landscaping at the mountain cedar. And that's what you see occurring here. And currently, two of the CCC built uh, water tanks for firefighting 
are still in service today at Barth's Retreat on the watershed. And here's a picture of two CCC enrollees fighting fire. They were often uh, responded to fires, not only on Mount Tim, but around Marin during fire season and were a great asset to the county. The Mountain Theater was the longest lasting project of the CCC, lasting from 1934 to 1941. It included the stone amphitheater, the landscaping, restrooms, drinking fountains, signs, and the dressing room. As I mentioned earlier, Camp Mount Tamalpais did the majority of the work, but after it closed in 1940, uh, some members of Camp Alpine Lake were sent to do some finishing work primarily to finish the dressing room. So both main CCC camps on Mount Tam were involved with the construction of the Mountain Theater. Here are the plans of, for the Mountain Theater as envisioned by Emery Knight, the, the landscape architect who came up with the plan in 1925. By 1933 in the creation of the CCC, only very limited work was done and there was very little money available to do the work and the CCC made the plan come to life. So starting in 1934, a major portion of the work was building the seating. So the lower 20 tiers of the Mountain Theater were built between 1934 and 1938, and the upper 20 tiers were built between 38 and 1940. It was a very labor-intensive job using block and tackle and a lot of manual labor. Some of the finishing work in 1940 with additional landscaping and the foundations of the dressing room. Other work performed by the CCC included erosion control work, including riprap and rock work in several creeks, including Redwood Creek and Muir Woods, which later more recently has been removed to restore fish habitat, but you can still find examples of this work in Phoenix Creek Lagunitas Creek and Deer Park Creek. They also installed check dams in Redwood Creek and in the Bon Tempe Meadow area in the area now submerged by Bon Tempe Lake. And they also did erosion control work on roads and trails. Some of the other CCC projects on Mount Tam included installing phone and power lines. Phones were not only used for just general communication, but before reliable two-way radios that's how the water district in the Tamil Pires Forest Fire District reported fires with using telephones. And the power lines, like you see being laid here, were used to bring electricity to the park. Uh, three of the lake keeper and patrolman homes for the water district, two at Phoenix Lake and the one at Lake Lagunitas, got their electricity because of the CCC. They also built various structures to support park operations. They built a stone entranceway to Phoenix Lake or now Natalie Coffin Green Park. They installed miles of fencing along the park boundaries. You have to remember at the time, a lot of the surrounding areas that are now incorporated in the various parks, GGNRA, the Water District and State Parks were private ranch land and the parks were interested in keeping the cattle out. They also built gates for the fire roads. Most of those have, gone, have disappeared but the gate at Alpine Dam for Kent Pump Road shows the artistic work that the CCC did. They also built the fish rearing ponds at Lake Lagnitas, did improvements at West Point Inn, and improved or built parking areas. Other duties included being surveyors, assisting with search and rescue. I found a documented case of helping the CCC help find a lost boy in Muir Woods and something tying into one of my other interests is the military aviation accidents in Marin. In 1935, a crew member on an Army Air Corps B-10 bomber fell out of a hatch on the bottom of the aircraft without a parachute somewhere between Point Reyes and Hamilton Field. And several CCC camps, including Camp Mount Tamalpais, looked for this lost airman and it was Camp Mount Tamalpais enrollees who found his remains. They also responded to emergencies such as floods and storms. 
And at Muir Woods, they worked contact stations and performed a function that is the equivalent of being a park guide for the National Park Service. The last major project on Mount Tam completed by the CCC occurred between 1939 and 1941 when they helped clear trees and vegetation from the new high water line when Alpine Dam was raised, which was completed in 1941, early 42. They also relocated Kent Trail along Alpine Lake at the time and relocated the Swede George Pipeline along Alpine Lake, which parallels the Kent Trail. The legacy of the CCC, in less than 10 years, it left a lasting legacy for America and parks. The extensive development and park expansion made possible by the CCC is largely responsible for the national, the modern national park and state park systems. And I would say the Mount Tam we all know today was largely responsible because, or largely became into being because of the work of the CCC. By the numbers, uh, they planted 3 billion trees nationwide, constructed 34, over 3,400 fire lookouts, for, built 97,000 miles of fire roads. It's a pretty amazing amount of work that they did. Park and recreation work completed. They completed work in 34, uh, 94 national park units, 181 state county and municipal parks. They helped establish somewhere between 700 and 800 state parks. There were 900 camps nationwide dedicated to park improvements. They improved 40,000 acres of campgrounds, built 80,000 acres of new campgrounds, 6,000 acres of picnic areas, at least 2,000 drinking fountains, and over 12,000 comfort stations. They improved over 100,000 miles of existing trails, 28,000 miles of new trails, more than 200 visitor centers, museums, and interpretive sites, 2,000 2, trail shelters, 2,500 rustic cabins, 10,000 support structures, and 75 recreational lakes nationwide. In their time on Mount Tam, they operated for a total of 10 years of total time this translates, if you consider a 40 hour work week over the course of a 10 year period with the typical camp being occupied by about 2,000 or 200 men between three and 4,000 million, three to 4 million hours of labor were provided to Mount Tam in its protection and development of its parks and protection of its resources. There are criticisms of the National Park Service, uh, including racial segregation. Initially, some of the parks in the North and the West, including California, were integrated, but by 1935, they were all resegregated. And in the Bay Area, a uh, state park camp at East Bay Mud's San Pablo Dam, they had to relocate the black enrollees to another camp due to complaints from the town of Richmond. They also, have criticism about their predator, insect, and rodent control work and using pesticides, draining swamps and wetlands, introducing non-native plants for erosion control, disrupting fish-bearing streams, developing roadless areas, and locally there was a lot of criticism for the building of Laureldale Fire Road and then some of the behavior of the enrollees. There were cases of enrollees on their off time being drunk and disruptive, and in one case, a San Anselmo man was arrested by the federal government for the possession of government property, but he was released when it was determined CCC enrollees sold him the government property. In California, these are the national park units that received and uh, CCC work and the list of the state parks. So some of the remaining factor uh, and reminder and legacy on Mount Tam is a picnic shelter at Lake Lagunitas, the Phoenix Lake picnic area, the Mountain Theater, which not only is the crown jewel of CCC work on Mount Tam, but is nationally one of the CCC's crown jewels, the Gardner Lookout, 
the Ben Johnson Trail. You can find the remains of Rattlesnake Camp with the drinking fountain and sink. Boochak Camp on Mount Tam is one of the prime examples with some of the best remaining CCC work, such as a six burner stove and sink and drinking fountain. The steep ravine trail ladder, though rebuilt, has its origins with the seas. The Cataract Trail Bridge below Helenmark Junction, which was installed by the CCC with a veteran company in September of 1934 and is still in use to this day. The arch entrance to Muir Woods, the Fern Creek Stone Bridge at Muir Woods. And to this day, you have the CCC inspired. Uh, infrastructure such as the uh, trail bridge at Carson Falls Trail and many of the entrance signs to the Mount Tamalpais watershed, which are done in that park rustic style. Today, there's at least 133 conservation corps nationwide, and there remains bipartisan support for the reestablishment of a national conservation corps. I happen to really like the California Conservation Corps. Motto, hard work, low pay, and miserable conditions. So one enrollee who later became involved in the environmental movement stated, before there was Earth Day, there was a CCC. It's, the CCC is largely responsible for the state park system and national park system. It democratized the parks and fulfilled the vision of the state park movement. It shaped a common heritage and look for parks not only locally, but across the country, and it introduced parks and conservation to working class enrollees and brought it to Main Street. And this translated into broad support for the conservation movement and the birth of the modern environmental movement after World War II. So I'll hand it back to Deborah now. I hope you all enjoyed today's presentation and we'll go ahead and open it up to questions. Hey, Matt, wonderful presentation. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful, um, great film footage. I, I have to ask, uh, how was the CCC crews uh, received by the local community? They were very well received. Uh, there was a great deal of support within Marin for the CCC. Granted, there were a few complaints from individuals, but as a community, broad support, they got involved with some of the local churches at the time. The communities really supported it. The Water District movie I played incorrectly stated the camp shut down in 1938, but actually it was uh, shuttered only for a brief period. Sometimes the camps on Mount Tam wouldn't be occupied in the summer because the crews would go to the Sierra for the summer and then come to Marin for the winter. So, but when the camp at Alpine Lake was threatened with closure, the community and our local congressmen all lobbied for its continuation. So there was broad community support for the CCC work here on Mount Tam. Great, well, let's get to some of the questions. Uh, I think you semi addressed the first one. This is from Katie. Were any of the CCC camps integrated? Yeah, uh, between 1933 and 35, th there were some in northern states and western states, including California, that were integrated. This includes Humboldt Redwood State Park with an integrated camp. And there's a great um, National Archive movie, I think it's called in the land of the giants, which is about CCC work on in California in the state parks and in several of the uh, vignettes in it, you can see racially integrated camps. Unfortunately, uh, by 19, late to mid to late 1935, all the camps were segregated nationwide and it was an opportunity missed in many ways. Granted, the Jim Crow South wouldn't have been open to it. Texas actually had some integrated camps, but it didn't go so well because when you see the group photos, they have all the white enrollees together and then off to the side, they had the black enrollees. But um, 
when the camp at uh, Humboldt Redwood State Park was resegregated, uh, the CCC members there said how much they were going to miss their fellow enrollees. And it sounds like they even had a going away party for them. So I think it was a mixed bag and ultimately an opportunity missed, but sadly it also reflected the values of that time. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a question from Diane. Where did the rocks come from that were used for the seating in the Mountain Theater? And um, can you also add, Matt, how many rocks were used, their weight, and how they were moved around? So I don't know exactly how many rocks were used, but the upper parking lot for the Mountain Theater, which is owned by the Water District, is referred to as the quarry lot. And there is serpentine there and the seats at the Mountain Theater are serpentine. So most likely they were quarried where the current quarry lot is, where in some cases they might've been transported down by truck to the stage area where they used a block and tackle system to raise them. And a lot of these rocks would, would weigh several hundred pounds to probably over a ton each. I mean, if you go through the photos, you can see how massive some of the rocks were. And you do not see a lot of how big these rocks were because they're buried well into the ground. Do you know how many men worked on the, the theater? Per day, um, for example? It probably varied. I mean, the, the typical camp with 200 men, they often break them down into 25 men sections. So there were probably at least 25 working at the Mountain Theater. And then I just wanted to hit on something else related to the stones. I didn't mention it in the program, but for the three bear hut at Phoenix Lake and the picnic area at Lake Lagunitas and also the old picnic area at Phoenix Lake, the CCC used rock from the building of the Pine Mountain Road that once again, serpentine rock that they gathered during the road building. And then they transported it down to the picnic areas for use in the structures and the barbecues. And how did they move these large rocks around at the theater? Well, to move them around, to get them close to the block and tackle. In one of the pictures I show a truck that almost looks like a tow truck. It has a crane mechanism on the back and it's carrying a really big rock on the back of it. So I think they would use a truck to move it to where the block and tackle systems were set up. And then you would probably uh, chains to wrap around it and then move it to the desired seating. Incredible. It's amazing work. You, yes, big work. Was anybody injured in the process? I'm sure injuries occurred. Um, I don't, I haven't come across any information that people were, but given the nature of the work and this was the pre-OSHA days, I'm sure injuries were common. I know nationally, uh, CCC enrollees were killed fighting fire. They were killed in vehicle accidents, falling trees. We had no fatalities here in Marin, but I guarantee there were people injured. And that's one reason the camps all had doctors because injuries were probably fairly commonplace, mostly minor injuries, but it wouldn't be uncommon probably for an enrollee to get a broken bone. Okay, on to another question. This is from Dick Spotswood. Hi, Dick. Were there any provisions, were any provisions, if any, were made for women to participate in the CCC? No, once again, it was reflecting the values of the time. In the New England, they had, some of the states there had a CCC-like program for women, but there was never anything done nationally because initially they wanted to employ the unemployed young men who 54% of them were unemployed or underemployed at the time. There wasn't a large female workforce at the time. If the CCC had survived into World War II, it probably would have ended up recruiting women to do the work, just like a lot of traditional uh, back then male jobs were opened up to women, such as uh, the Rosie the Riveters and railroad workers. But in the 1930s, that was nothing was tried on a national scale like that. 
Okay, here we have a question from Sherry. When was Bon Tempe Lake built? After the CC was there? Yes, it was built in 1948. Okay. Um, did World, this is from Paul, did World War II end the CCC? Basically, it did. Um, so leading up to World War II, there was less and less enrollees, and a lot of the CCC work starting in 1940 transitioned to defense-related work, like coastal fortifications and building military bases, because FDR knew what was coming. He knew we were going to be dragged dragged into the Second World War. So it evolved. And once World War II occurred, it was pretty much the end of the CCC. There's a state park in South Carolina where the work was never completed because once the enrollees who were young men heard that Pearl Harbor had been bombed, they basically stopped their work and all enrolled in the military. So to this day, the South Carolina State Park System has left the work uncompleted. It's kind of a memorial to both the CCC and the greatest generation and all the veterans of World War II. The last CCC work done in parks in the Bay Area was a completion of the uh, museum and visitor center at the top of Mount Diablo, which was completed by a veterans company. So veterans of the First World War and the Spanish-American War. Okay, I'm gonna to go to the chat. Uh, here it is, there's a couple of questions in here. Interesting maps, are, are these available for public view? This is from Virginia. Um, the water district map, um, I put up there earlier. I can send a copy out. It's really interesting to look at it. You couldn't see the details, but it spelled out a lot of the CCC work done on the water district just in a seven month period. And that's where, how I learned the rocks from the building of Pine Mountain Road, the extra serpentine rocks and boulders that they didn't need for the road were used to help build the Lagunitas and Phoenix Lake picnic areas. And uh, you can reach out to me using my email. Um, I probably could put that on chat right now. So if anyone wants to email me for more information, it's in the chat. Okay. Are you ready for another question? Yes. This is from Jill. Where can we see the film White Gold? Currently, it's not publicly available. Um, I probably could talk to our public information staff at the Water District and uh, uh, see if we could share it to the Water District YouTube. It's 42 minutes long and it's absolutely fascinating. It's so full of amazing information and a look at the Water District between 1935 and 1938 when it was filmed. Okay. Uh, Kathy writes, where was Camp Tamalpais located? Camp Mount Tamalpais was located where the Alice Eastwood Group Camp is currently located. Uh, just above Muir Woods at the end of Gravity Car Road. Um, and I, it's been years since I visited there. I've, it's on my to-do list because evidently there is, at least a few years ago, there was still one CCC structure remaining. And you can see the foundations to some of the other CCC structures. Okay. And we've got a question from John. Hi, John. He's the innkeeper at the West Point Inn. And he asks, what improvements were made to the West Point Inn? I don't have that full list. Um, prob probably the person to talk to on that might be Fred Runner. He would probably have a better answer. But I know for one example, the drinking fountain out front that until a few years ago, or I guess at least 10 years ago now, used to be in service. That's a CCC feature. So. And I think they did some structural improvements and maybe worked on the cabins, but I need to get a little bit more documentation on that. Okay, I've got a question for you, Matt. Tell me some of the topics of the other things that you talk about on Mount Tam. I know about plane crashes, wonderful talk. So I've have the talks on the 
plane crashes, military aviation accidents of Marin with an emphasis on the Mount Cam crashes. I've done a presentation for First Wednesday, um, basically a year on Mount Tam from a ranger's perspective, showcasing some of my photography. And I've also done a program on the history of the watershed and the Water District's Ranger Program, which is actually one of the oldest in the state dating back to 1917. Granted, we weren't called Rangers back then. If you looked at those badges earlier, you note only the National Park Service at the, in the 1930s were called rangers. So the water district rangers were either late, called lake keepers or patrolmen, with the lake keepers focusing around the lakes and the patrolmen patrolling rest of the mountain. And at the time, the state park rangers were called park wardens, and in some cases, park custodians. In 19, I believe 1945, state parks adopted the ranger job title and the water district adopted the ranger job title in 1975 and then changed it to park ranger in 1979. So. Oh, and I forgot one more program, the lakes of Mount Tam. Yes, the lakes. Someone just wrote it in the history of the lakes. I saw that. It's like, oh yeah, the <laughs> lake program. Do you remember in your interview? Now it's been some years since I interviewed you and it's a wonderful interview, but remember when I asked you, could you be the voice of Mount Tam and tell us what it is that we can do for the mountain and what and what we, we shouldn't be doing on the mountain? Well, what you can do to protect the mountain, I mean, it's an extremely special place to for everyone in Marin. And sometimes these days it's sometimes being loved to death. So be respectful of the mountain, the other people using it, and the rules, the rules are there for a reason, to protect the resources of the park and to try to make everyone's um, visit uh, enjoyable. I'd also encourage people to the water districts in the early phases of a recreation management plan, if you care about the mountain, get involved in that process when there's an opportunity. And when you're up in the mountain, just treat it and the people you, you see with courtesy and respect. Okay. Now, couple, while you were talking, a couple more questions came in and then we'll, we'll close. This is from Paul. Does Barry Spitz's book about the MMWD discuss the contributions of the CCC, you know? It's been a few, almost 10 years since I read it. So I'm sure there's a mention in it, but I'm not sure to what extent, because I know Lincoln Farley's books, Mount Tamil Pius and History, has a whole chapter on the CCC. And Barry Spitz's books, Tamil Pius Trails, mentions trails built by the CCC, such as Yolanda Trail, where the, which was completely built by the CCC. It was one of the last major trails built by the seas in the late 30s and where it's chiseled along the cliff edge, just above Phoenix Lake, that just has all the hallmarks of a CCC built trail. What is the hallmark of a CCC built trail? Um, they were very well engineered, especially the one they built from scratch, very well engineered. Um, a lot of rock work to at creek crossings and also to prevent the trail from migrating downhill. You can see that a lot on the section of Northside Trail that they built. They, uh, another hallmark is stone steps and stone retaining walls. You can see this, for example, on Cataract Trail, where there's both stair steps that they installed and in other locations along Cataract, steps they actually chiseled into the rocks. They also often used logs for bridges, and you can still see that on the Ben Johnson Trail and the Cataract Trail. These are all hallmarks of CCC built trails, and often the trails they built are so well engineered, often they don't even need a great deal of maintenance to this day. They still need a little maintenance, but they often follow uh, contour lines and just are extremely well engineered. 
This is a question from Paul. How about also encourage everyone to join? Well, actually, yeah, it is a question to join the TCC. Well, that's for individuals um, to decide. I don't want to endorse any one organization, but get involved in the groups that help protect and promote Mount Tam, responsible recreational use, and play a role in protecting Mount Tam. And there's a lot of them out there. Okay. Thank you, Matt, for this wonderful, wonderful talk. We'd love to have you back another day, another night, for another talk. And thank you for all your service. You're welcome. For all that you do and all that you share. Um, I encourage our audience to go listen to Matt's oral history. You can go to the Mill Valley Public Library, look in the oral history collection, or you can go to the the Mill Valley Historical Society website and look in our or the, the oral collection there. But his is a wonderful, wonderful interview filled with information and filled with passion and love for Mount Tamil Pius. And Deborah, can I add one last thing? Sure. If anyone out there has pictures of the picnic areas of Mount Tam, including Lake Lagunitas or Phoenix Lake, or some of the trails, especially from the 1930s through about 1970. I would love to see those photos because I'm still looking for some really good photos of the picnic shelters, for example, or some of the bridges and picnic areas before the 1970s, because unfortunately some of the CCC features were lost in the mid 1970s. So I'm looking for historic photos. And once again, if you have anything like that, you can email me at mcircle, that's M-C-E-R-K-E-L at marinwater.org, because I would love to include photos like that in any future presentations. Okay, good. All righty. Well, um, I just want to remind the audience that this event was recorded and will be available in the next couple of days. Uh, the, um, you can go to the Mill Valley Historical Society page and um, look in the first Wednesday speaker series events. And uh, please, if you enjoyed it uh, as much as I did, uh, you may want to even watch it again and certainly please share. Also, uh, uh, the Mill Valley Historical Society is very pleased to have published Adventures of Two Coast Miwok Children by our dear board member and my friend, Betty Girk. This beautiful book brings alive Marin County's Coast Miwok legacy as it explores the daily lives of a real boy and girl who lived in neighboring villages on San Francisco Bay in the late 1700s. The little boy in the story is named Huik Musa, but he would grow up to be known as Chief Marin, Marin's county's namesake. It's a precious and truly beautiful book and a great gift for children and adults. To order directly, please visit the Mill Valley Historical Society website. Thank you all for attending tonight. Thank you for your interest and your patronage. We'll see you next month. Our February 2nd speaker will be Lynn Downey, author of Arequipa Sanatorium, Life in California's Lung Resort for Women. And for those who don't know, the Arequipa Sanatorium operated in Fairfax, California from 1911 to 1975. So, no, excuse me, 1957. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, if you have any inclination to give to your public libraries, to the, to the, all the many agencies that keep our our uh, community so beautiful and so vital, and of course the historical societies, please do. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next month and thank you again, Matt. You're That's welcome. Okay, good night and be well.